Heck yeah. Howdy, howdy. Uh, nice to meet everybody here. Uh, I am Igor, I'm the owner, uh, CEO of Hello Dank. And uh, just gonna tell you a bit about ourselves. We're actually super local. We're right here in Katadi. We're like a hilarious company that all lives together. And uh, our office is actually in Santa Rosa, but we all live right here and like pass right next to you guys on the way to work. Uh, so we are, uh, we're an ice water hash company uh, first. That's our, that's our core. And we specifically make hash all from living soil farms. Uh, we don't put any chemicals in any of our products, and we believe it all starts with the soil. Uh, conventional dead soil is not going to produce the same type of cultivar that, that living soil does. Uh, living soil is more sustainable and better for the environment, so we kind of we want to partner with farms that, that have future generations in mind, aren't just in it just for the, just for the money type of thing. We are, uh, you know, we're all so we're also aligned with uh, small farmers, partially due to the fact that we're uh, fully self-funded. We're we're uh, we're not backed by anything, any investors, no corporate backing whatsoever. It's literally just us, a bunch of hash nerds. Um, so, <clears throat> living soil is basically soil that that has living microbial life in it and you feed the soil rather than feeding the plant directly. Uh, it ends up creating a much more resilient uh, plant and a much more um, true to genetic flavor because the plants uptake the nutrients that they need rather than being funnel fed what people think they need to bulk them up. Uh, and <clears throat> So we, we specifically partner with farms that'll do that, that'll, that, that, that'll grow sustainably. And <clears throat> uh, we make a number of products. You guys mainly have our pre-rolls right now, but you did have our hash. Um, I'm gonna start with the pre-rolls just because that's the ones you guys have currently. So it's all living soil flour, uh, living soil hash, like I was saying, uh, reclaimed ocean plastic tubes, so we're not creating new plastics. Uh, when we make our packaging, one of the biggest problems in the cannabis industry is packaging uh, and waste. So we don't wanna, we don't wanna create additional waste if we can avoid it. Um, there's 20% hash in the, in, the, in the joints, but there's actually 30% in the part you're smoking. So what we've done is we, we just put hash in, the, in, the, in every part except for the roach. The roach is just flour. Um, and what that does is it creates a better airflow, it creates a hashier hit, because uh, you're smoking a higher concentration of it in there, and uh, just overall it, it prevents it from running as much because uh, the, the oils, when you smoke a joint, the oils will gravitate towards the roach, and if there's a bunch of hash in there, it'll just kind of clog up part way through. Uh, so that's, those are the main points of, of the, of the pre-roll specifically. 20%, 20% hash overall, 30% in the part you're smoking, reclaimed ocean plastics, and um, also they're pretty darn affordable. We, we try to roll them out to be 12 bucks pretty much everywhere around the state. Um, and <clears throat> the, uh, the hash that we make, we have two different categories. We have a four star hash and a five star hash, which you guys may have noticed. So I wanna let you know what the difference between those two is. Uh, the four star hash is our bubble grade hash. So in order to make it into a hash container for us, you need to, produce uh, a material that we can make hash from that, that actually will create something that bubbles. So if it just sizzles or if it doesn't have any action, we won't package it as hash. Uh, so our very most affordable hash is still gonna bubble up. And then our, uh, our five star is actually our liquefying grade hash where when you add flame to it, it'll liquefy. Um, and the reason that we've separated the two grades is that uh, if you have more oil content in the hash, it'll be uh, more flavorful for longer, it'll, uh, it'll have a higher cannabinoid count altogether, and in general, um, it's just a good way of, of separating, um, you know, so that people have uh, consistency that they're used to, where like, you know, if they buy a white, a white four star container, they know every single time it's gonna bubble. If they buy a five star, they know every single time it's gonna liquefy. Um, rather than just like shot in the dark, oh, it's some hash, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not, type of thing. Um, 
So that, those are our two hashes. And something that separates us from a lot of other hash companies, we actually go the full-fledged and we hand press and hand roll each gram of hash. We're actually like sitting there, nep like uh, it's homage to Nepalese style of making hash where we're like, we're sitting in there and literally hand rolling gram after gram. Um, it's a very, it's like a, it's a work of, it's a work of love where we're like really trying to, you know, make sure that, that, that there's a personal touch with every single product. That, that we carry. Um, and in addition to the fact the personal touch and all that, uh, when you press hash, you actually, uh, you make it more bioavailable and you make it, um, make it tastier, it stays meltier longer, and it releases additional terpenes that aren't even present in flour naturally. There's about 50 additional terpenes that are released when you do a full-fledged uh, good press. If you just do a really quick like hand press, it will uh, bring it a lot of the way, but we make sure that before somebody buys it without having to do anything, it's already at the level that it needs to be to uh, be the most effective and be at its full flavor uh, profile. Um, <coughs> So those are the two. Those are the two hashes, and then our third product, which you guys had as well, was uh, our hash rosin. And the hash rosin is basically like the olive oil of hash. We're just using minimal, minimal heat and minimal pressure to squeeze uh, the oils out of the hash. Uh, you might have seen other companies with rosin. The main difference with us is that ours is all hash rosin. Uh, like I was saying, all our all uh, our core is hash. Uh, I've been making hash for about 12 years, and so it's like uh, it's a passion of mine, uh, and it's a passion of all of uh, our employees. So everything that we release will always be hash-based. Um, we <clears throat> we are. Uh, we're super stoked to be able to do it. Like I said, I've been making hash for 12 years, and finally are able to release it out to the masses. And um, yeah, we're uh, we're we're just super stoked to be super stoked to be able to do it. We're we're uh, we're a company that believes specifically in, you know, like I was saying, supporting small farmers, sustainability. We want to do that with our packaging. We also just believe in general that cannabis can be used as a can as a catalyst to change the world in a positive way, and uh, that's what that's what we uh, intend to do. Um, and without without uh, anything further, I was just wondering if if anybody has any questions or any uh, comments or anything. Alex. So you said you hand rolled your hand rolled. Um, weird question, but are you guys hand washing small batches? Are you using like is it all like small batch? Or like if you're getting say you guys have like a gelato hash bowl, I remember like is every one of those gelato hash bowls like that small little farm? Are they all going to be collectively different? Or like, how do you guys like to do your little batches? Awesome question. So um, we have scaled it up a bit, but everything is strain specific, farm specific. Uh, like that Gelato X that, that you're talking about, that one was from one of our dry farms. So they're, uh, it's actually a farm that doesn't even water. <laughs> they, they just find a really moist area and just plant their seeds. Uh, but we always try to keep things uh, farm specific uh, so we can give rec recognition to the farmer. Uh, we always write the farmer name on there. With, the, with that earlier uh, Gelato X, it was kind of small, but with our all future releases, actually a full color logo of the farm. Uh, we have, I've, I spun hash by hand for uh, about uh, eight or nine years straight. And I actually got tendonitis in my in my wrist now uh, from doing it for so long. We have shifted to using machines. Uh, we we have machines that have all food grade uh, tubing and stuff like that to keep everything super cleanly. But and they do very minimal agitation. It does take a little bit of the workload off, but it is still a very uh, t yeah. yeah. It's same quality, and then it's still it's still even with the machines. Um, it's still like a very labor intensive process. Um, so. Uh, we started, that was our roots, is just hand spinning each one. Now we're still small batch, but we're a little bit larger. And to make it so we're not all breaking our backs entirely, we have shifted to using some machines. Colin. As far as the joints go, um, the strain of the hash inside of it, mm -hmm. is it always going to be the same as the, um, as the joint, or are you mixing them up? Or? So we, uh, we have a very interesting way of coming up with every single one of our joints. So we actually try, we actually as a group, a small group where I guess we're, we're like six people, a lot of times like three of us at the office, we actually try every single joint um, before we send out. And, and every single prototype, sometimes we'll have like 20 different varieties. And 
Most of the time we do try to do the same flour with the same, like we'll take the flour and we'll take the exact same material, same farm, same strain, and we'll infuse them together. Uh, sometimes we found that certain hashes will really highlight a specific flour better. Uh, so for instance, currently you guys have a, uh, uh, a mimosa from Five Sisters Farms, which is mimosa on mimosa. And then you have a uh, Swami collab, which is actually two different strains. So it's Geranimals, um, which is actually not from Swami. So this is one of our few uh, uh, situations where we actually have two farms uh, in one pre-roll. Uh, it's Geranimals from Healing Hands Farm, and then it's uh, Swami's Deep Cherry Headlights Hash uh, infusion in there. And since we're a hash company and we have a bunch of hash, we have so much unreleased hash, we're constantly just going through all the inventory and we're trying to find what two flavors will complement each other the best. Um, a lot of times it is the exact same strain, but sometimes, sometimes we won't, we're not strict to that. We're, our idea is to release the best tasting thing, whether it be two different strains or just one. And then how long do you age your hash for? Um, so we, <clears throat> what we do, um, is we don't, we don't actually age it too incredibly long. What we do is we, we make it fresh and we keep it uh, in cold storage in the fridge in a glass jar uh, up until it's ready to go out. Um, when we make it, we leave it unpressed. And so up until it gets packaged, it stays unpressed in its, uh, in its kind of like a powder state, um, granule. And I personally don't think that the flavor um, is worth sacrificing to age it for incredibly long. Actually, in the Middle East, people used to age for 12, 13, 14, 15 years uh, before releasing the hash. It was kind of like wine. In fact, hash is kind of like the wine of the hash industry, or of the, of the cannabis industry. But um, what I've noticed is when you age it that long, you do have a lot of additional qualities that come into it, um, as far as just like the way it affects you and stuff like that, but you lose a lot of those really fresh terpenes that come from a uh, flower that's grown fresh. We're super blessed to be here in California where we have a wide variety of awesome farmers that are, that are, that are harvesting fresh. So our idea is actually to keep the trim or, or a biomass or whatever we end up making the hash out of at, at, in each instance as fresh as possible and then keeping the hash as fresh as possible as well. So it's actually, you know, it's a few months, few months age at the most. Sometimes it's coming out psh, super fresh. Yeah. Okay, can. Anybody else? Do you guys see yourself coming to the market with bows so people can like, just press out some bubble and make some flags and dab those? Coming out with which? Bubble. Bubble? Yeah, so you can like press out some flags. Do you know what I'm saying? Oh, Slaps. 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 oh you, are you saying like unpressed hash or. or you yeah. Know you know what I'm saying? Yeah, the powder hash. Yeah, the powder hash. It's like the powder hash that people are pressing into like little. Yeah, so, so we um, currently we don't have any intention to release unpressed hash, partially due to the reasons I was talking about where if you don't press it, you don't get those additional terpenes, you don't get the additional bioavailability, so you actually won't get as stoned as you could if it was fully pressed. Um, I'm not saying that we won't for sure forever, but it's not in the, it's not in the outlook right now. Right now we're, we're uh, on the hash side, we're, we're doing all temple balls. Um, if we ever switch from temple balls, it's still gonna be pressed. Uh, and then, and uh, basically the way that the, the temple ball is though, is uh, after it sits in the glass jar, it turns this kind of like buttery consistency. And at that point, um, it's really easy just to crumble into like a joint or whatever. Use any the same way that you would use unpressed hash. Uh, we believe flavor and effect over everything, so we're less so leaning. A lot of people leave their hash unpressed because it's like lighter color when it's like that, and a few other. Th it's like an aesthetic thing. It's just like in the food industry where we've had you know companies that that will grow fruits and vegetables specifically just to look red or to look you know a certain way. Uh, because that's what sells. Uh, we're not going in that direction. We're going in the direction of actually uh, making it as, as, as good of an effect as possible. You said that pressing the 
hash makes it taste better and like produces more terpenes? Mm -hmm. How does that? So there's just a, there's a conversion process that happens in a lot of the different terpenes. A lot of the terpenes in uh, cannabis, cannabis has a slew of terpenes that are still being uh, researched how many exactly and which ones do what. Uh, there's some that we've identified that people, people can talk about, but there's, um, when it comes to hash, it's, uh, it's a little bit more of a mystery, but what, uh, what, <clears throat> From the, from the minimal research that has been done, uh, basically there's a few different conversions that happen. First off, THC uh, is generally in cannabis is THCA, so it's THC with a carbon molecule attached to it. Um, when you smoke weed, it will, um, like when you add flame to it, that carbon molecule will break off as you're smoking it. But if you do uh, some of that conversion beforehand, um, you'll actually be able to um, feel, the, feel the effects way more so because you're not doing the conversion on the spot. It's already been done beforehand. So you're able to actually get all that THC. So that's on the THC level as far as bioavailability. Bio but the other part that really affects um, the taste and effect in general is that um, the terpenes, which they once pressed, it's like a hash is like this uh, resinous gland. It's basically, it's like, a, it's like a ball with a bunch of oils inside of it. And when we make hash, as opposed to all other processes, we want to keep that ball preserved the whole entire time. When you make uh, solvent-based extracts, whether it be uh, butane or CO2 or whatever, whatever gas you're using, you're actually busting that trichome head immediately and you're selectively, um, whatever the solvent uh, can dissolve in there, it'll, it'll uptake. Uh, whereas with hash, we keep that ball preserved. So in the end, uh, when it's unpressed still, it's still this ball of, uh, ball of oils. And when we press it, that's the only point when we actually end up busting that resin gland open. And when you bust it open uh, and the oils are released, they all kind of synergistically like combine and it'll it'll um that that fusion will um will release some additional flavors and some of the dormant terpenes yeah yeah exactly um and then as far as uh the taste when you do that the hash will actually end up staying meltier longer so uh like you know if you had some unpressed hash and you hit it and it'll kind of start to char over um, like a, a hit or two. It really depends wh how melty it is. Some unpressed hash will stay meltier for longer or, or shorter, but regardless of how long uh, each individual hash will stay melty, if you press any of them, they'll stay meltier longer. And when it stays meltier longer, it'll just create a smoother hit. Um, the more it stays in its like oil form, uh, the more it'll, it'll just taste, it'll taste way better. It won't taste like, a, like that charred taste. Yeah. Um, where does Temple Ball come from? Uh, Temple Ball comes from uh, Nepal. So in, uh, Nepal has been very, uh, for a very long time renowned as the, the best, creating the best hash in the world. Be well before California started making hash or uh, the cannabis market even started up here at all for, you know, for as long as, as long as it's kind of hard to say how far back it's even documented. But in Nepal, there's these temples where people sit and just roll temple balls all day. Um, and in fact, it's, it's actually a kind of hilarious thing. I've heard that, um, that children even early on, they get um, sought, sought out by these uh, people that, that, that administer these temples for the size of their hands. So uh, children have larger hands. They're, they're like, all right, like you'll be perfect for the temple to like sit up there and really endure uh, rolling temple balls for you know many hours every day and uh, so that's kind of that's kind of where where uh, where the where the term temple ball comes from uh, and the reason for it is when you um, when you just press hash it'll preserve it quite a bit of the way but when you actually spend the time to roll the temple ball it'll create this outer shell which protects all that's inside um, and it makes it so it cures like in its most optimal basically if you if you roll the temple ball you let it create that outer shell you put it in glass keep it dark and keep it in a cool environment that's the most optimal way that hash can then can be aged and basically preserved Tom? where do you source the flour and shrimp from <clears throat> we source all our flour and trim from uh, Humboldt, Mendocino, and Trinity counties currently. Uh, we have uh, 
you know, uh, we have a farm we're considering in, um, in Lake County as well, but it's all NorCal farms. Uh, we might branch out to other farms, but our main thing is, like I was saying, all living soil, sustainable, um, like we don't, we don't wanna work with people who buy new soil, dump it every year. We want people who are doing no-till, who are building their soil year after year. Uh, about half of our farmers are actually Dragonfly Earth Medicine certified. And what that means is they are um, certified regenerative farms. Uh, they create uh, pretty much all their inputs on the farm rather than going out to the store and buying additional bottle nutrients, which is obviously more plastics, and in general is just never going to be to the level of uh, when you have animals on the farm creating your compost. You have cover crops replenishing the soil. Um, there's also other um, stipulations that you uh, need to, or basically other requirements uh, to get the certification, like you can't use plastic tarps. There's a whole slew of different things to get in there. So that's our very top tier farms are basically at that level where they're, you know, they have like a whole system. They're not just pot farmers. They have, you know, they're, they're vegetable CSA farmers. They're doing, and they're growing, um, they're growing not just organic, they're growing beyond organic. Um, so that's the, about, half our farmers, the pre-rolls you guys have right now, the both Swami and uh, Five Sisters Farms are, are certified regenerative farms, so they're both those uh, like beyond organic growing practices. Um, on the very, very bottom tier, and not to say that they're in any way like a bottom tier farm, on our very baseline to get in, um, you need to be at least growing organic uh, and doing um, building, building soil, so that's basically, that's. That's our, um, we are, we're just manufacturers. I used to grow weed as well, but I've realized that if you spread yourself too thin, it's really hard to focus. So I've really steered towards just being a hash maker and just finding badass farms that, that, uh, that align with our values. Hey Jeff. 